When the house of Giuseppe Baldini collapsed, Grenouille was already on the road to Orléans. He had left the enveloping haze of the city behind him, and with every step he took away from it, the air about him grew clearer, purer, and cleaner. It became thinner as well. Gone was the roiling of hundreds, thousands of changing odors at every pace. Instead, the few odors there were, of the sandy road, meadows, the earth, plants, water, extended across the countryside in long currents, swelling slowly, abating slowly, with hardly an abrupt break. For Grenouille, this simplicity seemed a deliverance. The leisurely odors coaxed his nose. For the first time in his life, he did not have to prepare himself to catch the scent of something new, unexpected, hostile, or to lose a pleasant smell with every breath. For the first time, he could almost breathe freely, did not constantly have to be on the olfactory lookout. We say almost, for of course nothing ever passed truly freely through Grenouille's nose. Even when there was not the least reason for it, he was always alert to always wary of everything that came from outside and had to be let inside. His whole life long, even in those few moments when he had experienced some inkling of satisfaction, contentment and perhaps even happiness, he had preferred exhaling to inhaling. Just as he had begun life, not with a hopeful gasp for air, but with a blood-curdling scream. But except for that one proviso, which for him was simply a constitutional limitation, the further Grenouille got from Paris, the better he felt, the more easily he breathed, the lighter his step, until he even managed sporadically to carry himself erect, so that when seen from a distance he looked almost like an ordinary itinerant journeyman, like a perfectly normal human being. Most liberating for him was the fact that other people were so far away. More people lived more densely packed in Paris than in any other city in the world. Six, seven hundred thousand people lived in Paris. Its streets and squares teemed with them, and the houses were crammed full of them from cellars to attics. There was hardly a corner of Paris that was not paralysed with people, not a stone, not a patch of earth that did not reek of humans. As he began to withdraw from them, it became clear to Grenouille for the first time that for eighteen years their compacted human effluvium had oppressed him like air heavy with an imminent thunderstorm. Until now he had thought that it was the world in general he had wanted to squirm away from, but it was not the world, it was the people in it. You could live, so it seemed, in this world, in this world devoid of humanity. On the third day of his journey he found himself under the influence of the olfactory gravity of Orléans. Long before any visible sign indicated that he was in the vicinity of a city, Grenouille sensed a condensation of human stuff in the air, and, reversing his original plan, decided to avoid Orléans. He did not want to have his newfound respiratory freedom ruined so soon by the sultry climate of humans. He circled the city in a giant arc, came upon the Loire at Chateau Neuf, and crossed it at Sully. His sausage lasted that far. He bought himself a new one and, leaving the river behind, pushed on to the interior. He now avoided not just cities but villages as well. He was almost intoxicated by air that grew ever more rarefied, ever more devoid of humankind. He would approach a settlement or some isolated farm only to get new supplies, buying his bread and disappearing again into the woods. After a few weeks, even those few travellers he met on out-of-the-way paths proved too much for him. He could no longer bear the concentrated odour that appeared punctually with farmers out to mow the first hay on the meadows. He nervously skirted every herd of sheep, not because of the sheep, but to get away from the odour of the shepherds. He headed straight across country and put up with mile-long detours whenever he caught the scent of a troop of riders still several hours distant. Not because, like other itinerant journeymen and vagabonds, he feared being stopped and asked for his papers, and then perhaps pressed into military service, he didn't even know there was a war on, but solely because he was disgusted by the human smell of the horsemen. And so it happened quite naturally, and as the result of no particular decision, that his plan to take the fastest road to Grasse gradually faded. The plan unravelled in freedom, so to speak, as did all his other plans and intentions. Grenouille no longer wanted to go somewhere, but only to go away. 
away from human beings. Finally, he travelled only by night. During the day he crept into thickets, slept under bushes, in the undergrowth, in the most inaccessible spots, rolled up in a ball like an animal, his earthen-coloured horse blanket pulled over his body and head, his nose wedged in the crook of an elbow, so that not the faintest foreign odour could disturb his dreams. He awoke at sunset, sniffed in all directions, and only when he could smell that the last farmer had left his fields and the most daring wanderer had sought shelter from the descending darkness, only when light and its presumed dangers had swept the countryside clean of people, did Grenouy creep out of hiding and set out again on his journey. He did not need light to see by. Even before, when he was travelling by day, he had often closed his eyes for hours on end and merely followed his nose. The gaudy landscape, the dazzling abrupt definition of sight, hurt his eyes. He was delighted only by moonlight. Moonlight knew no colours and traced the contours of the terrain only very softly. It covered the land with a dirty grey, strangling life all night long. This world moulded in lead, where nothing moved but the wind that fell sometimes like a shadow over the grey forests, and where nothing lived but the scent of the naked earth, was the only world that he accepted, for it was much like the world of his soul. He headed south, approximately south, for he did not steer by magnetic compass, but only by the compass of his nose, which sent him skirting every city, every village, every settlement. For weeks he met not a single person, and he might have been able to cradle himself in the soothing belief that he was alone in a world bathed in darkness or the cold light of the moon, had his delicate compass not taught him better. Humans existed by night as well, and there were humans in the most remote regions. They had only pulled back, like rats, into their lairs to sleep. The earth was not cleaned of them, for even in sleep they exuded their odour, which then forced its way out between the cracks of their dwellings and into the open air, poisoning a natural world only apparently left to its own devices. The more Grenouille had become accustomed to purer air, the more sensitive he was to human odour, which suddenly, quite unexpectedly, would come floating by in the night, ghastly as the stench of manure, betraying the presence of some shepherd's hut or charcoal burner's cottage or thieves' den. And then he would flee further, increasingly sensitive to the increasingly infrequent smell of humankind. Thus his nose led him to ever more remote regions of the country, ever further from human beings, driving him on ever more insistently towards the magnetic pole of the greatest possible solitude. That pole, the point of the kingdom most distant from humankind, was located in the Massif Central of the Auvergne, about five days' journey south of Clermont, on the peak of a 6,000-foot-high volcano named Blanc du Cantal. The mountain consisted of a giant cone of blue-grey rock and was surrounded by an endless, barren highland studded with a few trees charred by fire and overgrown with grey moss and grey brush, out of which here and there brown boulders jutted up like rotten teeth. Even by light of day the region was so dismal and dreary that the poorest shepherd in this poverty-stricken province would not have driven his animals here. And by night, by the bleaching light of the moon, it was such a god-forsaken wilderness that it seemed not of this world. Even Lebrun, the bandit of the Auvergne, though pursued from all sides, had preferred to fight his way through to the Cévennes and there be captured, drawn and quartered, rather than to hide out on the Plan du Cantal where certainly no one would have sought or found him, but where likewise he would certainly have died a solitary, living death that had seemed to him worse still. For miles around the mountain there lived not one human being, nor even a respectable mammal. At best a few bats and a few beetles and adders. No one had scaled the peak for decades. Grenouille reached the mountain one August night in the year 1756. As dawn broke, he was standing on the peak. He did not yet know that his journey was at an end. He thought that this was only a stopping place on the way to ever purer air, and he turned full circle and let his nose move across the vast panorama of the volcanic wilderness. To the east, where the broad high plain of Saint-Fleur and the marshes of the Rieux River lay.
to the north, to the region from which he had come, and where he had wandered for days through pitted limestone mountains, to the west, from where the soft wind of morning brought him nothing but the smells of stone and tough grass, finally to the south, where the foothills of the Plon stretched for miles to the dark gorges of the Truyère. Everywhere, in every direction, humanity lay equally remote from him, and a step in any direction would have meant closer proximity to human beings. The compass spun about. It no longer provided orientation. Grenouille was at his goal. And at the same time, he was taken captive. As the sun rose, he was still standing on the same spot, his nose held up to the air. With a desperate effort, he tried to get a whiff of the direction from which threatening humanity came, and of the opposite direction to which he could flee still further. He assumed that in whatever direction he turned, he ought to detect some latent scrap of human odour. But there was nothing. Here there was only peace, olfactory peace, if it can be put that way. Spread all about, as if softly rustling, lay nothing but the drifting, homogeneous odour of dead stones, of grey lichen, and of withered grasses. Nothing else. Grenouille needed a very long time to believe that he was not smelling. He was not prepared for his good luck. His mistrust fought against his good sense for quite a while. He even used his eyes to aid him as the sun rose, and he scanned the horizon for the least sign of human presence, for the roof of a hut, the smoke of a fire, a fence, a bridge, a herd. He held his hands to his ears and listened for a scythe being wetted, for the bark of a dog or the cry of a child. That whole day he stood fast in the blazing heat on the peak of the Plan du Cantal and waited in vain for the slightest evidence. Only as the sun set did his mistrust gradually fade before an ever-increasing sense of euphoria. He had escaped the abhorrent taint. He was truly, completely alone. He was the only human being in the world. He erupted with thundering jubilation, like a shipwrecked sailor ecstatically greeting the sight of an inhabited island after weeks of aimless drifting. Grenouille celebrated his arrival at the mountain of solitude. He shouted for joy. He cast aside his rucksack, blanket and walking stick and stamped his feet on the ground, threw his arms to the sky, danced in circles, roared his own name to the four winds, clenched his fists, shaking them triumphantly at the great wide country lying below him and at the setting sun. Triumphantly, as if he personally had chased it from the sky. He carried on like a madman until late into the night. He spent the next few days settling in on the mountain, for he had made up his mind that he would not be leaving this blessed region all that soon. First he sniffed around for water, and in a crevasse a little below the top found it running across the rock in a thin film. It was not much, but if he patiently licked at it for an hour, he could quench his daily need for liquids. He also found nourishment in the form of small salamanders and ring snakes, he pinched off their heads, then devoured them whole. He also ate dry lichen and grass and mossberries. Such a diet, although totally unacceptable by bourgeois standards, did not disgust him in the least. In the past weeks and months he had no longer fed himself with food processed by human hands, bread, sausage, cheese, but instead, whenever he felt hungry, had wolfed down anything vaguely edible that had crossed his path. He was anything but a gourmet. He had no use for sensual gratification, unless that gratification consisted of pure, incorporeal odours. He had no use for creature comforts either, and would have been quite content to set up camp on bare stone. But he found something better. Near his watering spot, he discovered a natural tunnel leading back into the mountain by many twists and turns, until after a hundred feet or so it came to an end in a rock slide. The back of the tunnel was so narrow that Grenouille's shoulders touched the rock, and so low that he could walk only hunched down. But he could sit, and if he curled up, could even lie down. This completely satisfied his requirements for comfort. For the spot had incalculable advantages. At the end of the tunnel it was pitch-black night even during the day. It was deathly quiet, and the air he breathed was moist, salty, salty 
cool. Grenouille could smell at once that no living creature had ever entered the place. As he took possession of it, he was overcome by a sense of something like sacred awe. He carefully spread his horse blanket on the ground as if dressing an altar and lay down on it. He felt blessedly wonderful. He was lying a hundred and fifty feet below the earth inside the loneliest mountain in France, as if in his own grave. Never in his life had he felt so secure, certainly not in his mother's belly. The world could go up in flames out there, but here he would not even notice it. He began to cry softly. He did not know whom to thank for such good fortune. In the days that followed, he went into the open only to lick at his watering spot, quickly to relieve himself of his urine and excrement, and to hunt lizards and snakes. They were easy to bag at night when they retreated under flat stones or into little holes where he could trace them with his nose. He climbed back up to the peak a few more times during the first weeks to sniff out the horizon. But soon that had become more a wearisome habit than a necessity, for he had not once scented the least threat. And so he finally gave up these excursions and concerned himself only with getting back into his crypt as quickly as possible once he had taken care of the most basic chores necessary for simple survival. For here, inside the crypt, was where he truly lived. Which is to say, for well over twenty hours a day in total darkness and in total silence and in total immobility, he sat on his horse blanket at the end of the stony corridor, his back resting on the rock slide, his shoulders wedged between the rocks, and enjoyed himself. We are familiar with people who seek out solitude, penitents, failures, saints or prophets. They retreat to deserts, preferably, where they live on locusts and honey. Others, however, live in caves or cells on remote islands. Some, more spectacularly, squat in cages mounted high atop poles swaying in the breeze. They do this to be nearer to God. Their solitude is a self-mortification by which they do penance. They act in the belief that they are living a life pleasing to God. Or they wait months, years, for their solitude to be broken by some divine message that they hope then speedily to broadcast among mankind. Grenouille's case was nothing of the sort. There was not the least notion of God in his head. He was not doing penance, nor waiting for some supernatural inspiration. He had withdrawn solely for his own personal pleasure, only to be nearer to himself. No longer distracted by anything external, he basked in his own existence and found it splendid. He lay in his stony crypt like his own corpse, hardly breathing, his heart hardly beating, and yet lived as intensively and dissolutely as ever a rake had lived in the world outside. The setting for these debaucheries was, how could it be otherwise, the innermost empire where he had buried the husks of every odour encountered since birth. To enhance the mood, he first conjured up those that were earliest and most remote, the hostile, steaming vapours of Madame Gaillard's bedroom, the bone-dry, leathery bouquet of her hands, the vinegary breath of Father Terrier, the hysterical, hot, maternal sweat of Bussy the wet-nurse, the carrion stench of the Cimetière des Innocents, the homicidal odour of his mother. And he wallowed in disgust and loathing, and his hair stood on end at the delicious horror. Sometimes, if this repulsive aperitif did not quite get him into stride, he would allow himself a brief odoriferous detour to Grimal's for a whiff of the stench of raw, meaty skins and tanning broths, or he imagined the collective effluvium of six hundred thousand Parisians in the sultry, oppressive heat of late summer. And then, all at once, the pent-up hate would erupt with orgasmic force. That was, after all, the point of the exercise. Like a thunderstorm, he rolled across these odours that had dared offend his patrician nose. He thrashed at them as hail thrashes a grain field. Like a hurricane, he scattered the rabble and drowned them in a grand, purifying deluge of distilled water. And how just was his anger! How great his revenge! Ah! What a sublime moment! Grenouille, the little man, quivered with excitement, his body writhed with voluptuous delight, and arched so high that he slammed his head against the roof of the tunnel 
only to sink back slowly and lie there lolling in satiation. It really was too pleasant, this volcanic act that extinguished all obnoxious odours. Really too pleasant. This was almost his favourite routine in the whole repertoire of his innermost universal theatre, for it imparted to him the wonderful sense of righteous exhaustion that comes after only truly grand heroic deeds. Now he could rest a while in good conscience. He stretched out, to the extent that his body fitted within the narrow stony quarters. Deep inside, however, on the cleanly swept mats of his soul, he stretched out comfortably to the fullest and dozed away, letting delicate scents play about his nose. A spicy gust, for instance, as if born here from springtime meadows. A mild May wind wafting through the first green leaves of beech. A sea breeze with the bitterness of salted almonds. It was late afternoon when he arose. Something like late afternoon, for naturally there was no afternoon, or forenoon, or evening, or morning. There was neither light nor darkness, nor were there spring meadows, nor green beech leaves. There were no real things at all in Grenouille's innermost universe, only the odours of things. Which is why the façon de parler speaks of that universe as a landscape, a no more than adequate expression to be sure, but the only possible one, since our language is of no use when it comes to describing the smellable world. It was then late afternoon. That is a condition and a moment within Grenouille's soul, such as reigns over the south when the siesta is done, and the paralysis of midday slowly recedes, and life's urge begins again after such constraint. The heat kindled by rage, the enemy of sublime sense, had fled. The pack of demons was annihilated. The fields within him lay soft and burnished beneath the lascivious peace of his awakening, and they waited for the will of their lord to come upon them. And Grenouille rose up, as noted, and shook the sleep from his limbs. He stood up, the great innermost Grenouille. Like a giant he planted himself in all his glory and grandeur, splendid to look upon. Damn shame that no one saw him, and looked about him, proud and majestic. Yes, this was his empire, the incomparable empire of Grenouille, created and ruled over by him, the incomparable Grenouille, laid waste by him if he so chose, and then raised up again, made boundless by him and defended with a flaming sword against every intruder. Here there was naught but his will, the will of the great, splendid, incomparable Grenouille. And now that the evil stench of the past had been swept away, he desired that his empire be fragrant. And with mighty strides he passed across the fallow fields and sowed fragrance of all kinds, wastefully here, sparingly there, in plantations of endless dimension and in small, intimate parcels, strewing seeds by the fistful or tucking them in one by one in selected spots. To the furthermost regions of his empire, Grenouille the Great, the frantic gardener, hurried, and soon there was not a cranny left into which he had not thrown a seed of fragrance. And when he saw that it was good, and that the whole earth was saturated with his divine Grenouille seeds, then Grenouille the Great let descend a shower of rectified spirit, soft and steady, and everywhere and over all the seeds began to germinate and sprout, bringing forth shoots to gladden his heart. On the plantations it rolled in luxurious waves, and in the hidden gardens the stems stood full with sap. The blossoms all but exploded from their buds. Then Grenouille the Great commanded the rain to stop, and it was so, and he sent the gentle sun of his smile upon the land, whereupon to a bud, the hosts of blossoms unfolded their glory from one end of his empire unto the other, creating a single rainbowed carpet woven from myriad precious capsules of fragrance. And Grunwee the Great saw that it was good, very, very good, and he caused the wind of his breath to blow across the land, and the blossoms, thus caressed, spilled over with scent and intermingled their teeming scents into one constantly changing scent 
that in all its variety was nevertheless merged into the odour of universal homage to him, Grenoui the Great, the Incomparable, the Magnificent, who, enthroned upon his gold-scented cloud, sniffed his breath back in again, and the sweet savour of the sacrifice was pleasing unto him. And he deigned to bless his creation several times over, from whom came thanksgiving with songs of praise and rejoicing, and yet further outpourings of glorious fragrance. Meanwhile evening was come, and the scent spilled over still and united with the blue of night to form ever more fantastic airs. A veritable gala of scent awaited, with one gigantic burst of fragrant diamond-studded fireworks. Grunwy the Great, however, had tired a little, and yawned, and spoke, Behold, I have done a great thing, and I am well pleased. But as with all works once finished, it begins to bore me. I shall withdraw, and to crown this strenuous day, I shall allow myself yet one more delectation in the chambers of my heart. So spoke Grenoui the Great, and while the peasantry of scent danced and celebrated beneath him, he glided with wide-stretched wings down from his golden cloud, across the nocturnal fields of his soul, and home to his heart. Ah, returning home was pleasant. The double role of avenger and creator of worlds was not a little taxing, and then to be celebrated afterwards for hours on end by one's own offspring was not the perfect way to relax either. Weary of the duties of divine creator and official host, Grenoui the Great longed for some small domestic bliss. His heart was a purple castle. It lay in a rock-strewn desert, concealed by dunes, surrounded by a marshy oasis, and set behind stone walls. It could be reached only from the air. It had a thousand private rooms, and a thousand underground chambers, and a thousand elegant salons, among them one with a purple sofa where Grenoui no longer Grenouille the Great, but only the quite private Grenouille, or simply dear little Jean-Baptiste, would recover from the labours of the day. The castle's private rooms, however, were shelved from floor to ceiling, and on those shelves were all the odours that Grenouille had collected in the course of his life, several million of them and in the castle's cellars the best scents of his life were stored in casks. When properly aged, they were drawn off into bottles that lay in miles of damp, cool corridors, and were arranged by vintage and estate. There were so many that they could not all be drunk in a single lifetime. Once dear little Jean-Baptiste had finally returned to his chez soi, lying on his simple, cosy sofa in his purple salon, his boots finally pulled off, so to speak. He clapped his hands and called his servants, who were invisible, intangible, inaudible, and above all, inodorous, and thus utterly imaginary servants, and ordered them to go to the private rooms and get this or that volume from the great library of odours, and to the cellars to fetch something for him to drink. The imaginary servants hurried off, and Grenouille's stomach cramped in tormented expectation. He suddenly felt like a drunkard who is afraid that the shot of brandy he has ordered at the bar will, for some reason or other, be denied him. What if the cellar or the library were suddenly empty, if the wine in the casks had gone sour? Why were they keeping him waiting? Why did they not come? He needed the stuff now, he needed it desperately, he was addicted, he would die on the spot if he did not get it. Calm yourself, Jean-Baptiste, calm yourself, my friend, they're coming. They're coming, they're bringing what you crave. The servants are winging their way here with it. They are carrying the book of odours on an invisible tray, and in their white-gloved, invisible hands they are carrying those precious bottles. They set them down ever so carefully. They bow, and they disappear. And then, left alone at last, once again, left alone, Jean-Baptiste reaches for the odours he craves, opens the first bottle, pours a glass full to the rim, 
puts it to his lips and drinks. Drinks the glass of cool scent down in one draught, and it is luscious. It is so refreshingly good that dear Jean-Baptiste's eyes fill with tears of bliss, and he immediately pours himself a second glass. A scent from the year 1752, sniffed up in spring, before sunrise on the Pont Royal, his nose directed to the west, from where a light breeze bore the blended odours of sea and forest, and a touch of the tarry smell of the barges tied up at the bank. It was the scent from the end of his first night spent roaming about Paris without Grimal's permission. It was the fresh odour of the approaching day, of the first daybreak that he had ever known in freedom. That odour had been the pledge of freedom. It had been the pledge of a different life. The odour of that morning was for Grenouille the odour of hope. He guarded it carefully, and he drank of it daily. Once he had emptied the second glass, all his nervousness, all his doubt and insecurity fell away from him and he was filled with glorious contentment. He pressed his back against the soft cushions of his sofa, opened a book, and began to read from his memoirs. He read about the odours of his childhood, of his school days, about the odours of the broad streets and hidden nooks of the city, about human odours, and a pleasant shudder washed over him, for the odours he now called up were indeed those that he despised, that he had exterminated. With sickened interest, Grenouille read from the book of revolting odours, and when his disgust outweighed his interest, he simply slammed the book shut, laid it aside, and picked up another. All the while he drank without pause from his noble sense. After the bottle of hope, he uncorked one from the year 1744, filled with warm scent of the wood outside Madame Gaillard's house. And after that he drank a bottle of the scent of a summer evening, imbued with perfume and heavy with blossoms, gleaned from the edge of a park in Saint-Germain-des-Prés, dated 1753. Side 7 He was now scent logged. His arms and legs grew heavier and heavier as they pressed into the cushions. His mind was wonderfully fogged. But it was not yet the end of his debauch. His eyes could read no more. True, the book had long since fallen from his hand, but he did not want to call an end to the evening without having emptied one last bottle, the most splendid of all, the scent of the girl from the Rue des Marais. He drank it reverently, and he sat upright on the sofa to do so. Although this was difficult, and the purple salon whirled and swayed with every move, like a schoolboy, his knees pressed together, his feet side by side, his left hand resting on his left thigh, that was how little Grenouille drank the most precious scent from the cellars of his heart, glass after glass, and grew sadder and sadder as he drank. He knew that he was drinking too much. He knew that he could not handle so much good scent, and yet he drank till the bottle was empty. He walked along the dark passage from the street into the rear courtyard. He made for the glow of light. The girl was sitting there, pitting yellow plums. Far in the distance, the rockets and petards of the fireworks were booming. He put the glass down and sat there for a while yet, several minutes, stiff with sentimentality and guzzling, until the last aftertaste had vanished from his palate. He stared vacantly ahead. His head was suddenly as empty as the bottle. Then he toppled sideways onto the purple sofa, and from one moment to the next sank into a numbed sleep. At the same time, the other Grenouille fell asleep on his horse blanket, and his sleep was just as fathomless as that of the innermost Grenouille, for the Herculean deeds and excesses of the one had more than exhausted the other. They were, after all, one and the same person. When he awoke, however, he did not awaken in the purple salon of his purple castle behind the seven walls, nor upon the vernal fields of scent within his soul, but most decidedly in his stony dungeon at the end of a tunnel, on hard ground, in the dark. And he was nauseated with hunger and thirst, and as chilled and miserable as a drunkard after a night of carousing. He crept on all fours out of his tunnel. Outside, it would be some time of day or another, usually towards the beginning or end of night. 
but even at midnight the brightness of the starlight pricked his eyes like needles. The air seemed dusty to him, acrid, searing his lungs. The landscape was brittle. He bumped against the stones, and even the most delicate odours came sharp and caustic into a nose unaccustomed to the world. Grenouille, the tick, had grown as touchy as a hermit crab that has left its shell to wander naked through the sea. He went to his watering spot, licked the moisture from the wall for an hour, for two. It was pure torture. Time would not end, time in which the real world scorched his skin. He ripped a few scraps of moss from the stones, choked them down, squatted, shitting as he ate. It must all be done quickly, quickly, quickly. And as if he were a hunted creature, a little soft-fleshed animal, and the hawks were already circling in the sky overhead, he ran back to his cave, to the end of the tunnel where his horse blanket was spread. There he was safe at last. He leaned back against the stony debris, stretched out his legs and waited. He had to hold his body very still, very still, like some vessel about to slosh over from too much motion. Gradually he managed to gain control of his breathing. His excited heart beat more steadily. The pounding of the waves inside him subsided slowly. And suddenly solitude fell across his heart like a dusky reflection. He closed his eyes. The dark doors within him opened, and he entered. The next performance in the theatre of Grenouille's soul was beginning. And so it went, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out. So it went for seven long years. Meanwhile, war raged in the world outside, a world war. Men fought in Silesia and Saxony, in Hanover and the Low Countries, Bohemia and Pomerania. The king's troops died in Hesse and Westphalia, on the Balearic Islands, in India, on the Mississippi and in Canada, if they had not already succumbed to typhoid on the journey. The war robbed a million people of their lives, France of its colonial empire, and all the warring nations of so much money that they finally decided, with heavy hearts, to end it. One winter during this period, Grenouille almost froze to death without ever noticing it. For five days he lay in his purple salon, and when he awoke in his tunnel he was so cold he could not move. He closed his eyes again and would have slept himself to death. But then the weather turned around, there was a thaw, and he was saved. Once the snow was so deep that he did not have the strength to burrow down to the lichen, he fed himself on the stiff carcasses of frozen bats. Once a dead raven lay at the mouth of the cave. He ate it. These were the only events in the outside world of which he took notice for seven years. Otherwise he lived only within his mountain, only within the self-made empire of his soul. And he would have remained there until his death, since he lacked for nothing, if catastrophe had not struck driving him from his mountain, vomiting him back out into the world. The catastrophe was not an earthquake, nor a forest fire, nor an avalanche, nor a cave-in. It was not an external catastrophe at all, but an internal one, and as such particularly distressing, because it blocked a Grenouille's favourite means of escape. It happened in his sleep, or rather in his dreams, or better still, in a dream while he slept in the heart of his fantasies. He lay on his sofa in the purple salon and slept, the empty bottles all about him. He had drunk an enormous amount, with two whole bottles of the scent of the red-haired girl for a nightcap. Apparently it had been too much, for his sleep, though deep as death itself, was not dreamless this time but threaded with ghostly wisps of dreams. These wisps were clearly recognisable as scraps of odours. At first they merely floated in thin threads past Grenouille's nose, but then they grew thicker, more cloud-like. And now it seemed as if he were standing in the middle of a moor from which fog was rising. The fog slowly climbed higher. Soon Grenouille was completely wrapped in fog, saturated with fog, 
and it seemed that he could not get his breath for the foggy vapour. If he did not want to suffocate, he would have to breathe the fog in, and the fog was, as noted, an odour. And Grenouille knew what kind of odour. The fog was his own odour. His, Grenouille's, own body odour was the fog. And the awful thing was that Grenouille, although he knew that this odour was his odour, could not smell it. Virtually drowning in himself, he could not for the life of him smell himself. As this became clear to him, he gave a scream as dreadful and loud as if he were being burned alive. The scream smashed through the walls of the purple salon, through the walls of the castle, and sped away from his heart across the ditches and swamps and deserts, hurtled across the nocturnal landscape of his soul like a firestorm, howled its way out of his mouth, down the winding tunnel, out into the world and far across the high plains of saint Flour, as if the mountain itself was screaming. And Grenouille awoke at his own scream. In waking he thrashed about as if he had to drive off the odourless fog trying to suffocate him. He was deathly afraid. His whole body shook with the raw fear of death. Had his scream not ripped open the fog, he would have drowned in himself, a gruesome death. He shuddered as he recalled. And as he sat there shivering and trying to gather his confused, terrified thoughts, he knew one thing for sure. He would change his life, if only because he did not want to dream such a frightening dream a second time. He would not survive it a second time. He threw his horse blanket over his shoulders and crept out into the open. It was already morning outside, a late February morning. The sun was shining. The earth smelled of moist stones, moss and water. On the wind there already lay a light bouquet of anemones. He squatted on the ground before his cave. The sunlight warmed him. He breathed in the fresh air. Whenever he thought of the fog that he had escaped, a shadow would pass over him. And he shuddered, too, from the pleasure of the warmth he felt on his back. It was good, really, that this external world still existed, if only as a place of refuge. Nor could he bear the awful thought of how it would have been not to find a world at the entrance of the tunnel. No light, no odour, no nothing. Only that ghastly fog inside, outside, everywhere. Gradually the shock subsided. Gradually the grip of anxiety loosened, and Grenouille began to feel safer. Towards noon he was his old, cold-blooded self. He laid the index and middle fingers of his left hand under his nose and breathed along the backs of his fingers. He smelled the moist spring air spiced with anemones. He did not smell anything of his fingers. He turned his hand over and sniffed at the palm. He sensed the warmth of his hand, but smelled nothing. Then he rolled up the ragged sleeve of his shirt, buried his nose in the crook of his elbow. He knew that this was the spot where all humans smell like themselves. But he could smell nothing. He could not smell anything in his armpits, nor on his feet, nor around his genitals when he bent down to them as far as he possibly could. It was grotesque. He, Grenouille, who could smell other people miles away, was incapable of smelling his own genitals, not a hand span away. Nevertheless, he did not panic, but considered it all coolly and spoke to himself as follows. It is not that I do not smell, for everything smells. It is rather that I cannot smell that I smell, because I have smelled myself day in, day out since my birth, and my nose is therefore dulled against my own smell. If I could separate my own smell, or at least a part of it, from me, and then return to it after being weaned from it for a while, then I would most certainly be able to smell it, and therefore me. He laid the horse blanket aside and took off his clothes, or at least what remained of them. Rags and tatters were what he took off. For seven years he had not removed them from his body. They had to be fully saturated with his own odour. He tossed them into a pile at the cave entrance and walked away. Then, for the first time in seven years, 
he once again climbed to the top of the mountain. There he stood on the same spot where he had stood on the day of his arrival, held his nose to the west, and let the wind whistle around his naked body. His intention was thoroughly to air himself, to be pumped so full of the west wind, and that meant with the odour of the sea and wet meadows, that this odour would counterbalance his own body odour, creating a gradient of odours between himself and his clothes, which he would then be in a position to smell. And to prevent his nose from taking in the least bit of his own odour, he bent his body forwards, stretching his neck out as far as he could against the wind, with his arms stretched behind him. He looked like a swimmer just before he dives into the water. He held this quite ridiculous pose for several hours, and even by such pale sunlight, his skin, maggot white from lack of sun, was turned a lobster red. Towards evening, he climbed back down to the cave. From far off, he could see his clothes lying in a pile. The last few yards, he held his nose closed and opened it again only when he had lowered it right down onto the pile. He made the sniffing test he had learned from Baldini, snatching up the air and then letting it out again in spurts. And to catch the odour, he used both hands to form a bell around his clothes, with his nose stuck into it as the clapper. He did everything possible to extract his own odour from his clothes. But there was no odour in them. It was most definitely not there. There were a thousand other odours, the odour of stone, sand, moss, resin, raven's blood. Even the odour of the sausage that he had bought years before near Sully was clearly perceptible. Those clothes contained an olfactory diary of the last seven, eight years. Only one odour was not there, his own odour, the odour of the person who had worn them continuously all that time. And now he began to be truly alarmed. The sun had set. He was standing naked at the entrance to the tunnel where he had lived in darkness for seven years. The wind blew cold and he was freezing, but he did not notice that he was freezing, for within him was a counter-frost, fear. It was not the same fear that he had felt in his dream, the ghastly fear of suffocating on himself, which he had had to shake off and flee whatever the cost. What he now felt was the fear of not knowing much of anything about himself. It was the opposite pole of that other fear. He could not flee it, but had to move towards it. He had to know for certain, even if that knowledge proved too terrible, whether he had an odour or not. And he had to know now, at once. He went back into the tunnel. Within a few yards he was fully engulfed in darkness, but found his way as if by brightest daylight. He had gone down this path many thousands of times, knew every step and every turn, could smell every low-hanging jut of rock and every tiny protruding stone. It was not hard to find the way. What was hard was fighting back the memory of the claustrophobic dream rising higher and higher within him like a flood tide with every step he took. But he was brave. That is to say, he fought the fear of knowing with the fear of not knowing, and he won the battle because he knew he had no choice. When he had reached the end of the tunnel, there where the rock slide slanted upwards, both fears fell away from him. He felt calm, his mind was quite clear, and his nose sharp as a scalpel. He squatted down, laid his hands over his eyes, and smelled. Here on this spot, in this remote stony grave, he had lain for seven years. There must be some smell of him here, if anywhere in this world. He breathed slowly. He analysed exactly. He allowed himself time to come to a judgement. He squatted there for a quarter of an hour. His memory was infallible, and he knew precisely how this spot had smelled seven years before. Stony and moist, salty, cool and so pure that no living creature, man or beast, could ever have entered the place. Which was exactly how it smelled now. He continued to squat there for a while, quite calm, simply nodding his head gently. Then he turned around and walked, at first hunched down, 
but when the height of the tunnel allowed it erect, out into the open air. Outside he pulled on his rags, his shoes had rotted off him years before, threw the horse blanket over his shoulders, and that same night left the Plan du Cantal, heading south. He looked awful. His hair reached down to the hollows of his knees, his scraggly beard to his navel. His nails were like talons, and the skin on his arms and legs, where the rags no longer covered his body, was peeling off in shreds. The first people he met, farmers in a field near the town of Pierrefort, ran off screaming at the sight of him. But in the town itself he caused a sensation. By the hundreds people came running to gape at him. Many of them believed he was an escaped galley slave. Others said he was not really a human being, but some mixture of man and bear, some kind of forest creature. One fellow, who had been to sea, claimed that he looked like a member of a wild Indian tribe in Cayenne, which lay on the other side of the great ocean. They led him before the mayor. There, to the astonishment of the assembly, he produced his journeyman's papers, opened his mouth, and related in a few gabbled but sufficiently comprehensible words, for these were the first words that he had uttered in seven years, how he had been attacked by robbers, dragged off, and held captive in a cave for seven years. He had seen neither daylight nor another human being during that time, had been fed by an invisible hand that let down a basket in the dark, and finally set free by a ladder, without his ever knowing why, and without ever having seen his captors or his rescuer. He had thought this story up, since it seemed to him more believable than the truth. And so it was, for similar attacks by robbers occurred not infrequently in the mountains of the Auvergne and Languedoc, and in the Cévennes. At least the mayor recorded it all without protest, and passed his report on to the Marquis de la Taillade Espinasse, liege lord of the town and member of parliament in Toulouse. At the age of forty, the Marquis had turned his back on life at the court of Versailles and retired to his estates, where he lived for science alone. From his pen had come an important work concerning dynamic political economy. In it he had proposed the abolition of all taxes on real estate and agricultural products, as well as the introduction of an upside-down progressive income tax, which would hit the poorest citizens the hardest, and so force them to a more vigorous development of their economic activities. Encouraged by the success of his little book, he wrote a tract on the raising of boys and girls between the ages of five and ten. Then he turned to experimental agriculture. By spreading the semen of bulls over various grasses, he attempted to produce a milk-yielding animal-vegetable hybrid, a sort of udder flower. After initial successes that enabled him to produce a cheese from his milk grass, described by the Academy of Sciences of Lyon as tasting of goat, though slightly bitter, he had to abandon his experiments because of the enormous cost of spewing bull semen by the hundreds of quarts across his fields. In any case, his concern with matters agrobiological had awakened his interest not only in the ploughed clod, so to speak, but in the earth in general and its relationship to the biosphere in particular. He had barely concluded his work with the milk-yielding udder flower when he threw himself with great élan into unflagging research for a grand treatise on the relationship between proximity to the earth and vital energy. His thesis was that life could develop only at a certain distance from the earth, since the earth itself constantly emits a corrupting gas, a so-called fluidum letale, which lames vital energies and sooner or later utterly extinguishes them. All living creatures therefore endeavour to distance themselves from the earth by growing. That is, they grow away from it and not, for instance, into it, which is why their most valuable parts are lifted heavenwards. The ears of grain, the blossoms of flowers, the head of man. And therefore, as they begin to bend and buckle back towards the earth in old age, they will inevitably fall victim to the lethal gas into which they are in turn finally changed once they have decomposed after death. When the Marquis de la Taillade Espinasse received word that in Pierre Fort an individual had been found who had dwelt in a cave for seven years, that is, completely encapsulated by the corrupting element of the earth, he was beside himself with delight, and immediately had Grenouille brought to his laboratory 
where he subjected him to a thorough examination. He found his theories confirmed most graphically. The fluidum letale had already so assaulted Grenouille that his twenty-five-year-old body clearly showed the marks of senile deterioration. All that had prevented his death, Tayard Espinas declared, was that during his imprisonment Grenouille had been given earth-removed plants, presumably bread and fruits, for nourishment. And now his former healthy condition could only be restored by the wholesale expulsion of the fluidum, using a vital ventilation machine devised by Tayard Espinas himself. He had such an apparatus standing in his manor in Montpellier, and if Grenouille was willing to make himself available as the object of a scientific demonstration, he was willing not only to free him from hopeless contamination by earth gas, but he would also provide him with a handsome sum of money. Two hours later they were sitting in the carriage. Although the roads were in miserable condition, they travelled the sixty-four miles to Montpellier in just under two days. For despite his advanced age, the Marquis would not be denied his right personally to whip both driver and horses and to lend a hand whenever, as frequently happened, an axle or spring broke. So excited was he by his find, so eager to present it to an educated audience as soon as possible. Grenouille, however, was not allowed to leave the carriage even once. He was forced to sit there all wrapped up in his rags and a blanket drenched with earth and clay. During the trip he was given raw vegetable roots to eat. The Marquis hoped these procedures would preserve the contamination by earth's fluidum in its ideal state for a while yet. Upon their arrival in Montpellier, he had Grenouille taken at once to the cellar of his mansion and sent out invitations to all the members of the medical faculty, the botanical association, the agricultural school, the chemo physical club, the Freemason's Lodge, and other assorted learned societies, of which the city had no fewer than a dozen. And several days later, exactly one week after he had left his mountain solitude, Grenouille found himself on a dais in the great hall of the University of Montpellier, and was presented as the scientific sensation of the year to a crowd of several hundred people. In his lecture, Tayard Espinas described him as living proof of the validity of his theory of Earth's fluidum letale. While he stripped Grenouille of his rags, piece by piece, he explained the devastating effect that the corruptive gas had perpetrated on Grenouille's body. One could see the pustules and scars caused by the corrosive gas. There, on his breast, a giant, shiny red gas cancer a general disintegration of the skin, and even clear evidence of fluidal deformation of the bone structure, the visible indications being a club foot and a hunchback. The internal organs as well had been damaged by the gas, pancreas, liver, lungs, gallbladder and intestinal tract, as the analysis of a stool sample, accessible to the public in a basin at the feet of the exhibit, had proved beyond doubt. In summary, it could be said, that the paralysis of the vital energies caused by a seven-year contamination with fluidum letale tayad had progressed so far that the exhibit, whose external appearance, by the way, already displayed significant mole-like traits, could be described as a creature more disposed towards death than life. Nevertheless, the lecturer pledged that within eight days, using ventilation therapy in combination with a vital diet, he would restore this doomed creature to the point where the signs of a complete recovery would be self-evident to everyone, and he invited those present to return in one week to satisfy themselves of the success of this prognosis, which, of course, would then have to be seen as valid proof that his theory concerning Earth's fluidum was likewise correct. The lecture was an immense success. The learned audience applauded the lecturer vigorously and lined up to pass the days where Grenouille was standing. In his state of preserved deterioration, and with all his old scars and deformities, he did indeed look so impressively dreadful that everyone considered him beyond recovery and already half decayed, although he himself felt quite healthy and robust. Many of the gentlemen tapped him up and down in a professional manner, measured him, looked into his mouth and eyes. Several of them addressed him directly and inquired about his life in the cave and his present state of health. But he kept strictly to the instructions the Marquis had given him beforehand and answered all such questions with nothing more than a strained death rattle, 
making helpless gestures with his hands to his larynx, as if to indicate that that too was already rotted away by the fluidum letale tayad. At the end of the demonstration, Tayad Espinas packed him back up and transported him home to the storage room of his manor. There, in the presence of several selected doctors from the medical faculty, he locked Grenouille in his vital ventilation machine, a box made of tightly jointed pine boards, which, by means of a suction flue extending far above the house roof, could be flooded with air extracted from the higher regions and thus free of lethal gas. The air could then escape through a leather flap valve placed in the floor. The apparatus was kept in operation by a staff of servants who tended it day and night so that the ventilators inside the flue never stopped pumping. And so, surrounded by the constant purifying stream of air, Grenouille was fed a diet of foods from earth-removed regions. Dove bouillon, lark pie, ragout of wild duck, preserves of fruit picked from trees, bread made from a special wheat grown in high altitudes, wine from the Pyrenees, chamois milk and frozen frothy meringue from hens kept in the attic of the mansion, all of which was presented at hourly intervals through the door of a double-walled airlock built into the side of the chamber. This combined treatment of decontamination and revitalization lasted for five days. Then the Marquis had the ventilators stopped and Grenouille brought to a washroom where he was softened for several hours in baths of lukewarm rainwater, and finally waxed from head to toe with nut oil soap from Potosi in the Andes. His finger and toenails were trimmed, his teeth cleaned with pulverized lime from the Dolomites, he was shaved, his hair cut and combed, quaffed and powdered. A tailor, a cobbler, was sent for, and Grenouille was fitted out in a silk shirt with white jabot and white ruffles at the cuffs, silk stockings, frock coat, trousers and vest of blue velvet, and handsome buckled shoes of black leather, the right one cleverly elevated for his crippled foot. The Marquis personally applied white talcum makeup to Grenouille's scarred face, dabbed his lips and cheeks with crimson, and gave a truly noble arch to his eyebrows with the aid of a soft stick of linden charcoal. Then he dusted him with his own personal perfume, a rather simple violet fragrance, took a few steps back, and took some time to find words for his delight. Monsieur, he began at last, I am thrilled with myself. I am overwhelmed at my own genius. I have, to be sure, never doubted the correctness of my fluidal theory. Of course not. But to find it so gloriously confirmed by an applied therapy overwhelms me. You were a beast, and I have made a man of you. A veritable divine act. Do forgive me. I am so touched. Stand in front of that mirror there and regard yourself. You will realize for the first time in your life that you are a human being. Not a particularly extraordinary or in any fashion distinguished one, but nevertheless a perfectly acceptable human being. Go on, monsieur. Regard yourself and admire the miracle that I have accomplished with you. It was the first time that anyone had ever said, Monsieur, to Grenouille. He walked over to the mirror and looked into it. Before that day, he had never seen himself in a mirror. He saw a gentleman in a handsome blue outfit with a white shirt and silk stockings, and instinctively he ducked, as he had always ducked before such fine gentlemen. The fine gentleman, however, ducked as well, and when Grenouille stood up straight again, the fine gentleman did the same and then they both stared straight into each other's eyes. What dumbfounded Grenouille most was the fact that he looked so unbelievably normal. The Marquis was right. There was nothing special about his looks, nothing handsome, but then nothing especially ugly either. He was a little short of stature, his posture was a little awkward, his face a little expressionless. In short, he looked like a thousand other people. If he were now to go walking down the street, not one person would turn around to look at him. A man such as he now was, should he chance to meet him, would not even strike him as in any way unusual. Unless, of course, he smelled that the man, except for a hint of violets, had as little odour as the gentleman in the mirror, or himself standing there in front of it. 
and yet only ten days before farmers had run away screaming at the sight of him. He had not felt any different from the way he did now, and now if he closed his eyes he felt not one bit different from then. He inhaled the air that rose up from his own body and smelled the bad perfume and the velvet and the freshly glued leather of his shoes. He smelled the silk cloth, the powder, the makeup, the faint scent of the soap from Potosi. And suddenly he knew that it had not been the dove bouillon nor the ventilation hocus-pocus that had made a normal person out of him, but solely these few clothes, the haircut, and the little masquerade with cosmetics. He blinked as he opened his eyes and saw how the gentleman in the mirror blinked back at him and how a little smile played about his carmine lips, as if signalling to him that he did not find him totally unattractive. And Grenouille himself found that the gentleman in the mirror, this odourless figure dressed and made up like a man, was not all that bad either. At least it seemed to him as if the figure, once its costume had been perfected, might have an effect on the world outside that he, Grenouille, would never have expected of himself. He nodded to the figure and saw that in nodding back it flared its nostrils surreptitiously. The following day, the Marquis was just about to instruct him in the basic poses, gestures and dance steps he would need for his coming social debut. Grenouille faked a fainting spell and, as if totally exhausted and in imminent danger of suffocation, collapsed onto a sofa. The Marquis was beside himself. He screamed for servants, screamed for fan-bearers and portable ventilators, and while the servants scurried about, he knelt down at Grenouille's side, fanning him with a handkerchief soaked in bouquet of violets, and appealed to him, literally begged him to get to his feet, and please not to breathe his last just yet, but to wait, if at all possible, until the day after tomorrow, since the survival of the theory of the fluidum letale would otherwise be in utmost jeopardy. Grenouille twisted and turned, coughed groaned, thrashed at the handkerchief with his arms, and finally, after falling from the sofa in a highly dramatic fashion, crept to the most distant corner of the room. Not that perfume, he cried with his last bit of energy. Not that perfume, it will kill me. And only when Tayad Espinas had tossed the handkerchief out of the window and his violet-scented jacket into the next room, did Grenouille allow his attack to ebb, and, in a voice that slowly grew calmer, explained that as a perfumer he had an occupationally sensitive nose and had always reacted very strongly to certain perfumes, especially so during this period of recuperation. And his only explanation for the fact that the scent of violets in particular, a lovely flower in its own right, should so oppress him, was that the Marquis's perfume contained a high percentage of violet root extract, which, being of subterranean origin, must have a pernicious effect on a person like himself, suffering from the influence of fluidum letale. Yesterday, at the first application of the scent, he had felt quite queasy, and today, as he had once again perceived the odour of roots, it had been as if someone had pushed him back into that dreadful, suffocating hole where he had vegetated for seven years. His very nature had risen up against it. That was all he could say. And now that His Grace the Marquis had used his art to restore him to a life free of fluidal air, he would rather die on the spot than once again be at the mercy of the dreaded fluidum. At the mere thought of a perfume extracted from roots, he could feel his whole body cramping up. He was firmly convinced, however, that he would recover in an instant if the Marquis would permit him to design a perfume of his own one that would completely drive out the scent of violets. He had in mind an especially light, airy fragrance, consisting primarily of earth-removed ingredients, like O oh, of almond and orange blossom, eucalyptus, pine and cypress oils, a splash of such a scent on his clothes, a few drops on his neck and cheeks, and he would be permanently immune to any repetition of the embarrassing seizure that had just overwhelmed him. For clarity's sake, the proper forms of reported speech have been used here, but in reality this was a verbal eruption of uninterrupted blubberings, accompanied by numerous coughs and gasps and struggles for breath, all of which Grenouille accented with quiverings and fidgetings and rollings of the eyes. The Marquis was deeply impressed. 
It was, however, not so much his ward symptoms of suffering as the deft argumentation presented totally under the aegis of the theory of fluidum letale that convinced him. Of course it was the violet perfume, an obnoxious, earthbound, indeed subterranean product. He himself was probably infected by it after years of use, had no idea that day in, day out, he had been bringing himself ever nearer to death by using that scent. His gout, the stiffness in his neck, the enervation of his member, his hemorrhoids, the pressure in his ears, his rotten tooth, all of it doubtless came from the contagious fluidal stench of violet roots. And that stupid little man, that lump of misery there in the corner of the room, had given him the idea. He was touched. He would have loved to have gone over to him, lifted him up, and pressed him to his enlightened heart. But he feared that he still smelled too much of violets, and so he screamed for his servants yet again, and ordered that all the violet perfume be removed from the house, the whole mansion aired, his clothes disinfected in the vital air ventilator, and that Grenouille at once be conveyed in his sedan chair to the best perfumer in the city. And, of course, this was precisely what Grenouille had intended his seizure to accomplish. The science of perfumery was an old tradition in Montpellier, and although in more recent times it had lost ground to its competitor, the town of Grasse, there were still several good perfumers and lovers residing in the city. The most prestigious of them, a certain Runel, well aware of the trade he enjoyed with the house of the Marquis de Taillade Espinasse as its purveyor of soaps, oils and scents, declared himself prepared to take the unusual step of surrendering his studio for an hour to the strange journeyman perfumer from Paris who had been conveyed thither in a sedan chair. The latter refused all instructions, did not even want to know where things were. He knew his way round, he said, would manage well enough. And he locked himself in the laboratory and stayed there for a good hour, while Runel joined the Marquis's major domo for a couple of glasses of wine in a tavern, where he was to learn why his violet cologne was no longer a scent worth smelling. Runel's laboratory and shop fell short of being so grandly equipped as Baldini's perfume shop in Paris had been in its day. An average perfumer would not have made any great progress with its few floral oils, colognes and spices. Grenouille, however, recognised with the first inhaled sniff that the ingredients on hand would be quite sufficient for his purposes. He did not want to create a great scent. He did not want to create a prestigious cologne such as he had once made for Baldini, one that stood out amid a sea of mediocrity and tamed the masses, nor was even the simple orange blossom scent that he had promised the Marquis his true goal. The customary essences of neroli, eucalyptus and cypress were meant only as a cover for the actual scent that he intended to produce. That was the scent of humanness. He wanted to acquire the human being odour, if only in the form of an inferior temporary surrogate that he did not possess himself. True, the odour of human being did not exist any more than the human countenance. Every human being smelled differently. No one knew that better than Grenouille, who recognised thousands upon thousands of individual odours and could sniff out the difference of each human being from birth on. And yet, there was a basic perfumatory theme to the odour of humanity, a rather simple one, incidentally. A sweaty, oily, sour, cheesy, quite richly repulsive basic theme that clung to all humans equally, and above which each individual's aura hovered only as a small cloud of more refined particularity. That aura, however, the highly complex, unmistakable code of a personal odour, was not perceptible for most people in any case. Most people did not know that they even had such a thing, and moreover did everything they could to disguise it under clothes or fashionable artificial odours, only that basic odour, the primitive human effluvium, was truly familiar to them. They lived exclusively within it, and it made them feel secure, and only a person who gave off that standard vile vapour was ever considered one of their own. Side 8 It was a strange perfume that Grenouille created that day. There had never before been a stranger one on earth, it did not smell like a scent, but like a human being who gives off scent. If one had smelled this perfume in a dark room, one would have thought a second person was standing there. And if a human being who smelled like a human being had applied it, 
that person would have seemed to have the smell of two people, or, worse still, to be a monstrous double creature, like some figure that you can no longer clearly pinpoint because it looks blurred and out of focus, like something at the bottom of a lake beneath the shiver of waves. And to imitate this human odour, quite unsatisfactorily, as he himself knew, but cleverly enough to deceive others, Grenouille gathered up his most striking ingredients in Runel's workshop. There was a little pile of cat shit behind the threshold of the door leading out to the courtyard, still quite fresh. He took half a teaspoon of it and placed it together with several drops of vinegar and finely ground salt in a mixing bottle. Under the work table he found a thumbnail-sized piece of cheese, apparently from one of Runel's lunches. It was already quite old, had begun to decompose and gave off a biting, pungent odour. From the lid of a sardine tub that stood at the back of the shop, he scratched off a rancid, fishy something or other, mixed it with rotten egg and castorium, ammonia, nutmeg, horn shavings and singed pork rind, finely ground. To this he added a relatively large amount of civet, mixed these ghastly ingredients with alcohol, let it digest and filtered it into a second bottle. The bilge smelled revolting. Its stink was putrid, like a sewer, and if you fanned its vapour just once to mix it with fresh air, it was as if you were standing in Paris on a hot summer day, at the corner of the Rue aux Fers and the Rue de la Lingerie, where the odours from Les Halles, the Cimetière des Innocents, and the overcrowded tenements converged. On top of this disgusting base, which smelled more like a cadaver than a human being, Grenouille spread a layer of fresh, oily scents. Peppermint, lavender, turpentine, lime, eucalyptus, which he then simultaneously disguised and tamed with the pleasant bouquet of fine floral oils, geranium, rose, orange blossom and jasmine. After a second dilution with alcohol and a splash of vinegar, there was nothing left of the disgusting basic odour on which the mixture was built. The latent stench lay lost and unnoticeable under the fresh ingredients. The nauseous part, pampered by the scent of flowers, had become almost interesting. And strangely enough, there was no putrefaction left to smell, not the least. On the contrary, the perfume seemed to exhale the robust, vivacious scent of life. Grenouille filled two flacons with it, stoppered them and stuck them in his pockets. Then he washed the bottles, mortars, funnels and spoons carefully with water, rubbed them down with bitter almond oil to remove all traces of odour, and picked up a second mixing bottle. In it he quickly composed another perfume, a sort of copy of the first, likewise consisting of fresh and floral elements, but containing nothing of the witch's brew as a base, but rather a totally conventional one of musk, amber grease, a tiny bit of civet and cedarwood oil. By itself it smelled totally different from the first, flatter, more innocent, detoxified, for it lacked the components of the imitation human odour. But once a normal human being applied it and married it to his own odour, it could no longer be distinguished from the one that Grenouille had created exclusively for himself. After he had filled the second perfume into flacons, he stripped and sprinkled his clothes with the first. Then he dabbed himself in the armpits, between the toes, on the genitals, on the chest, neck, ears and hair, put his clothes back on and left the laboratory. As he came out on the street he was suddenly afraid, for he knew that for the first time in his life he was giving off a human odour. He found that he stank, stank quite disgustingly, and because he could not imagine that other people would not also perceive his odour as a stench, he did not dare go directly into the tavern where Runel and the Marquis's major domo were waiting for him. It seemed less risky to him first to try out his new aura in an anonymous environment. He slipped down towards the river through the darkest and narrowest alleyways where tanners and dyers had their workshops and carried on their stinking business. When someone approached, or if he passed an entryway where children were playing or women were sitting, he forced himself to walk more slowly bringing his odour with him in a large, compact cloud. From his youth on he had been accustomed to people passing him and taking no notice of him whatever, not out of contempt, as he had once believed, but because they were quite unaware of his existence. There was no space surrounding him, no waves broke from him into the atmosphere as with other people. 
He had no shadow, so to speak, to cast across another's face. Only if he ran right into someone in a crowd or in a street corner collision would there be a brief moment of discernment, and the person encountered would bounce off and stare at him for a few seconds as if gazing at a creature that ought not even to exist, a creature that, although undeniably there, in some way or other, was not present, and would take to his heels and have forgotten him, Grenouille, a moment later. But now, in the streets of Montpellier, Grenouille sensed and saw with his own eyes, and each time he saw it anew, a powerful sense of pride washed over him, that he exerted an effect on people. As he passed a woman who stood bent down over the edge of a well, he noticed how she raised her head for a moment to see who was there, and then, apparently satisfied, turned back to her bucket. A man who was standing with his back to him turned around and gazed after him with curiosity for a good while. The children he met scooted to one side, not out of fear, but to make room for him, and even when they came hurtling out of a side doorway right at him, they were not frightened, but simply slipped naturally past him, as if they had anticipated an approaching person. Several such meetings taught him to assess more precisely the power and effect of his new aura, and he grew more self-assured and cocky. He moved more rapidly towards people, passed by them more closely, even stretched out one arm a little, grazing the arm of a passer-by as if by chance. Once he jostled a man as if by accident while moving to pass around him. He stopped, apologised, and the man, who only yesterday would have reacted to Grunwee's sudden appearance as if to a thunderbolt, behaved as though nothing had happened, accepted the apology, even smiled briefly, and clapped Grunwee on the shoulder. He left the back streets and entered the square before the cathedral of Saint-Pierre. The bells were ringing. There was a crush of people at both sides of the portal. A wedding had just ended. People wanted to see the bride. Grenouille hurried over and mingled with the crowd. He shoved, bored his way in to where he wanted to be, where people were packed together most densely, where he could be cheek by jowl with them, rubbing his own scent directly under their noses. And in the thick of the crush, he spread his arms, spread his legs, and opened his collar so that the odour could flow unimpeded from his body. And his joy was boundless when he noticed that the others noticed nothing, nothing whatever, that all these men, women, and children standing pressed about him could be so easily duped, that they could inhale his concoction of cat shit, cheese, and vinegar as an odour just like their own, and accept him, Grenouille, the cuckoo's egg, in their midst as a human being amongst human beings. He felt a child against his knee, a little girl standing wedged in among the adults. He lifted her up with hypocritical concern and held her with one arm so that she could see better. The mother not only tolerated this, she thanked him as well, and the child yelled with delight. Grenouille stood there like that in the bosom of the crowd for a good quarter of an hour, a strange child pressed sanctimoniously to his chest. And while the wedding party passed by, to the accompaniment of the booming bells and the cheers of the masses and a pelting shower of coins, Grenouille broke out in a different jubilation, a black jubilation, a wicked feeling of triumph that set him quivering and excited him like an attack of lechery, and he had trouble to keep from spurting it like venom and spleen over all these people and screaming exultantly in their faces that he was not afraid of them that he hardly hated them any more, but that his contempt for them was profound and total, because they were so stupid they stank. Because they could be deceived by him, let themselves be deceived because they were nothing and he was everything. And as if to mock them, he pressed the child still closer to him, bursting out and shouting in chorus with the others, Hurrah for the bride! Long live the bride! Long live the glorious couple! When the wedding party had departed and the crowd had begun to disperse, he gave the child back to its mother and went into the church to recover from his excitement and rest a little. Inside the cathedral, the air was still filled with incense, billowing up in cold clouds from two censers at each side of the altar, and lying in a suffocating layer above the fainter odours of the people who had just been sitting there. 
Grenouille hunched down on the bench behind the choir. All at once, great contentment came over him. Not a drunken one, as in the days when he had celebrated his lonely orgies in the bowels of the mountain, but a very cold and sober contentment, as befits awareness of one's own power. He now knew what he was capable of. Thanks to his own genius, with a minimum of contrivance, he had imitated the odour of human beings and at one stroke had matched it so well that even a child had been deceived. He now knew that he could do much more. He knew that he could improve on this scent. He would be able to create a scent that was not merely human, but superhuman, an angel scent so indescribably good and vital that whoever smelled it would be enchanted and with his whole heart would have to love him, Grunwi, the bearer of that scent. Yes, that was what he wanted. They would love him as they stood under the spell of his scent, not just accept him as one of them, but love him to the point of insanity, of self-abandonment. They would quiver with delight, scream, weep for bliss. They would sink to their knees as if under God's cold incense, merely to be able to smell him. Grenouille. He would be the omnipotent God of scent, just as he had been in his fantasies, but this time in the real world and over real people. And he knew that all this was within his power, for people could close their eyes to greatness, to horrors, to beauty, and their ears to melodies or deceiving words. But they could not escape scent, for scent was a brother of breath. Together with breath it entered human beings who could not defend themselves against it, not if they wanted to live. And scent entered into their very core, went directly to their hearts, and decided for good and all between affection and contempt disgust and lust, love and hate. He who ruled scent ruled the hearts of men. Grenouille sat at his ease on his bench in the cathedral of Saint-Pierre and smiled. His mood was not euphoric as he formed his plans to rule humankind. There were no mad flashings of the eye, no lunatic grimace passed over his face. He was not out of his mind, which was so clear and buoyant that he asked himself why he wanted to do it at all. And he said to himself that he wanted to do it because he was evil, thoroughly evil. And he smiled as he said it, and was content. He looked quite innocent, like any happy person. He sat there for a while, with an air of devout tranquillity, and took deep breaths, inhaling the incense-laden air. And yet another cheerful grin crossed his face. How miserable this god smelled! How ridiculously bad the scent that this god let spill from him! It was not even genuine frankincense fuming up out of those thurables. A bad substitute, adulterated with linden and cinnamon dust and saltpetre. God stank! God was a poor little stinker! He had been swindled, this god had, or was himself a swindler, no different from Grenouille, only a considerably worse one. The Marquis de la Taillade Espinasse was thrilled with his new perfume. It was staggering, he said, even for the discoverer of the fluidum letale, to note what a striking influence on the general condition of an individual such a trivial and ephemeral item as perfume could have as a result of its being either earth-bound or earth-removed in origin. Grenouille, who but a few hours before had lain pale and near swooning, now appeared as fresh and rosy as any healthy man his age could. Why, even with all the qualifications appropriate to a man of his rank and limited education, one might almost say that he had gained something very like a personality. In any case, he, Tayard Espinas, would discuss the case in the chapter on vital dietetics in his soon-to-be-published treatise on the theory of the fluidum letale. But first he wished to anoint his own body with this new perfume. Renoui handed him both flacons of conventional floral scent, and the Marquis sprinkled himself with it. He seemed highly gratified by the effect. He confessed that after years of being oppressed by the leaden scent of violets, a mere dab of this made him feel as if he had sprouted floral wings. 
and if he was not mistaken, the beastly pain in his knee was already subsiding, likewise the buzzing in his ears. All in all he felt buoyant, revitalized, and several years younger. He approached Grenouille, embraced him, and called him my fluid old brother, adding that this was in no way a form of social address, but rather a purely spiritual one, in conspectu universalitatis fluidi letalis, before which, and before which alone, all men were equal. Also, and this he said as he disengaged himself from Grenouille, in a most friendly disengagement, without the least revulsion, almost as if he were disengaging himself from an equal, he was planning soon to found an international lodge that stood above all social rank, and the goal of which would be utterly to vanquish the fluidum letale and replace it in the shortest possible time with purest fluidum vitale. And even now he promised to win Grenouille over as the first proselyte. Then he had him write the formula for the floral perfume on a slip of paper, pocketed it, and presented Grenouille with fifty louis d'or. Precisely one week after the first lecture, the Marquis de la Taillade Espinas once again presented his ward in the great hall of the university. The crush was monstrous. All Montpellier had come, not just scientific Montpellier, but also and in particular social Montpellier, among whom were many ladies desirous of seeing the fabled caveman. And although Taillade's enemies primarily the champions of the Friends of the University Botanical Gardens and members of the Society for the Advancement of Agriculture had mobilized all their supporters, the exhibition was a scintillating success. In order to remind his audience of Grenouille's condition of only the week before, Tayard Espinas first circulated drawings depicting the caveman in all his ugliness and depravity. He then had them lead in the new Grenouille, dressed in a handsome velvet blue coat and silk shirt, rouged, powdered, and coiffed. And merely by the way he walked, so erect, and with dainty steps, and an elegant swing of the hips, by the way he climbed to the dais without anyone's assistance, bowing deeply and nodding with a smile now to one side, now to the other, he silenced every sceptic and critic. Even the friends of the university's botanical garden were embarrassedly speechless. The change was too egregious, the apparent miracle too overwhelming. Where but a week ago had cowered a drudge, a brutalized beast, there now stood a truly civilized, properly proportioned human being. An almost prayerful mood spread through the hall, and as Tayyad Espinas commenced his lecture, perfect silence reigned. He once again set forth his all too familiar theory about Earth's fluidum letale explained how and with what mechanical and dietetic means he had driven it from the body of his exhibit, replacing it with fluidum vitale. Finally, he demanded of all those present, friend and foe alike, that in the face of such overwhelming evidence they abandon their opposition to this new doctrine and make common cause with him, Tayard Espinas, against the evil fluidum and open themselves to the beneficial fluidum vitale. At this he spread his arms wide, cast his eyes heavenwards, and many learned men did likewise, and women wept. Grenouille stood at the dais, but did not listen. He watched with great satisfaction the effect of a totally different fluid, a much more real one, his own. As was appropriate for the size of the great hall, he had doused himself with perfume, and no sooner had he climbed the dais than the aura of his scent began to radiate powerfully from him. He saw, literally saw with his own eyes, how it captured the spectators sitting closest, was transmitted to those further back, and finally reached the last rows and the gallery. And whomever it captured, and Grenouille's heart leapt for joy within him, was visibly changed. Under the sway of the odour, but without their being aware of it, People's facial expressions, their airs, their emotions, were altered. Those who at first had gawked at him out of pure amazement now gazed at him with a milder eye. Those who had made a point of leaning back in their seats with furrowed, critical brows and mouths markedly turned down at the corners now leaned forward, more relaxed, and with a look of childlike ease on their faces. And as his odour reached them, even the faces of the timorous, frightened, and hypersensitive souls who had borne the sight of his former self with horror and beheld his present state with due misgiving now showed traces of amity 
indeed of sympathy. At the lecture's end, the entire assemblage rose to its feet and broke into frenetic cheering. Long live the fluidum vitale! Long live Tayad Espinas! Hurrah for the fluidal theory! Down with orthodox medicine! Such were the cries of the learned folk of Montpellier, the most important university town in the south of France, and the Marquis de la Tayad Espinas experienced the greatest hour of his life. Grenouille, however, having climbed down from the dais to mingle among the crowd, knew that these ovations were in reality meant for him, for him alone, Jean-Baptiste Grenouille, although not one of those cheering in the hall suspected anything of the sort. He stayed on in Montpellier for several weeks. He had achieved a certain fame and was invited to the salons, where he was asked about his life in the cave and about how the Marquis had cured him. He had to tell the tale of the robbers over and over, how they had dragged him off and how the basket was let down and about the ladder, and every time he added more striking embellishments and invented new details. And so he gained some facility in speaking, admittedly only a very limited one, since he had never in all his life handled speech well. And what was even more important to him, a practised routine for lying. In essence, he could tell people whatever he wanted, once they had gained confidence in him, and with the first breath they gained confidence in him, for they were inhaling his artificial odour, they believed everything. And in time he gained a certain self-assurance in social situations such as he had never known before. This was apparent even in his body. It was as if he had grown. His hump seemed to disappear. He walked almost completely erect. And when someone spoke to him, he no longer hunched over, but remained erect and returned the look directed at him. Granted, in this short time he did not become a man of the world, no dandy about town, no peerless social lion, but his cringing, clumsy manner fell visibly from him, making way for a bearing that was taken for natural modesty, or at worst for a slight inborn shyness that made a sympathetic impression on many gentlemen and many ladies, Sophisticated circles in those days had a weakness for everything natural and for a certain unpolished charm. When March came, he packed his things and was off, secretly, so early in the morning that the city gates had only just been opened. He was wearing an inconspicuous brown coat that he had bought second-hand at a market the day before and a shabby hat that covered half his face. No one recognised him, no one saw or noticed him for he had intentionally gone without his perfume that day. And when around noon the Marquis had inquiries made, the watchmen swore by all that's holy that they had seen all kinds of people leaving the city, but not the caveman, whom they knew and would most certainly have noticed. The Marquis then had word spread that, with his permission, Grenouille had left Montpellier to look after family matters in Paris. Privately he was dreadfully annoyed, for he had intended to take Grenouille on a tour through the whole kingdom, recruiting adherence to his fluidal theory. After a while he calmed down again, for his own fame had spread without any such tour, almost without any action on his part. A long article about the fluidum letale taillade appeared in the Journal des Savants, and even in the Courrier de l'Europe, and fluidally contaminated patients came from far and wide for him to cure them. In the summer of 1764, he founded the first Lodge of the Vital Fluidum, with 120 members in Montpellier and established branches in Marseille and Lyon. Then he decided to dare the move to Paris and from there to conquer the entire civilized world with his teachings. But first he wanted to provide a propaganda base for his crusade by accomplishing some heroic feat, one that would overshadow the cure of the caveman, indeed all other experiments. And in early December he had a company of fearless disciples join him on an expedition to the Pic du Canigou, which was on the same longitude with Paris and was considered the highest mountain in the Pyrenees. Though on the threshold of senescence, the man wanted to be borne to the summit at 9,000 feet and left there in the sheerest, finest, vital air for three whole weeks, whereupon, he announced, he would descend from the mountain precisely on Christmas Eve as a strapping lad of twenty. The disciples gave up shortly beyond Vernet, 
the last human settlement at the foot of the fearsome mountain. But nothing daunted the Marquis. Casting his garments from him in the icy cold and whooping in exultation, he began the climb alone. The last that was seen of him was his silhouette, hands lifted ecstatically to heaven and voice raised in song. He disappeared into the blizzard. His followers waited in vain that Christmas Eve for the return of the Marquis de la Taillade d'Espinasse. He returned neither as an old man nor a young one. Nor when early summer came the next year and the most audacious of them went in search of him, scaling the still snowbound summit of the Pic du Canigou, did they find any trace of him. No clothes, no body parts, no bones. His teachings, however, suffered no damage at all. On the contrary, soon the legend was abroad that there on the mountain peak he had wedded himself to the eternal fluidum vitale, merging with it and it with him, and now forever floated, invisible but eternally young, above the peaks of the Pyrenees, and whoever climbed up to him would encounter him there and remain untouched by sickness or the process of ageing for one full year. Well into the 19th century, Tayard's fluidal theory was advocated from many a chair at faculties of medicine and put into therapeutic practice by many an occult society. And even today, on both sides of the Pyrenees, particularly in Perpignan and Figueras, there are secret Tayadic lodges that meet once a year to climb the Pic du Canigou. There they light a great bonfire, ostensibly for the summer solstice and in honour of St. John, but in reality it is to pay homage to their master, Tayad Espinas, and his grand fluidum, and to seek eternal life. Whereas Grenouille had needed seven years for the first stage of his journey through France, he put the second behind him in less than seven days. He no longer avoided busy roads and cities, he made no detours. He had an odour, he had money, he had self-confidence, and he had no time to lose. By evening of the day he left Montpellier, he had arrived at Le Gros du Roi, a small harbour town southwest of Aigues-Mortes, where he boarded a merchant ship for Marseille. In Marseille he did not even leave the harbour, but immediately sought out a ship that brought him further along the coast to the east. Two days later he was in Toulon, in three more in Cannes. The rest of the way he travelled on foot. He followed a back road that led up into the hills, northwards into the interior. Two hours later he was standing on a rise, and before him was spread a valley several miles wide, a kind of basin in the landscape. Its surrounding rim made up of gently rising hills and a ridge of steep mountains, its broad bowl covered with fields, gardens and olive groves. The basin had its own special, intimate climate. Although the sea was so near that one could see it from the tops of the hills, there was nothing maritime, nothing salty and sandy, nothing expansive about this climate. Indeed, it possessed a secluded tranquillity, as if you were many days' journey distant from the coast. And although to the north the high mountains were covered with snow that would remain for a good while yet, it was not in the least raw or barren, and no cold wind blew. Spring was further advanced than in Montpellier. A mild haze lay like a glass bell over the fields. Apricot and almond trees were in bloom, and the warm air was infused with the scent of jonquils. At the other end of the wide basin, perhaps two miles off, a town lay among, or better clung to, the rising mountains. From a distance it did not make a particularly grand impression. There was no mighty cathedral towering above the houses, just a little stump of a church steeple, no commanding fortress, no magnificent edifice of note. The walls appeared anything but defiant. Here and there the houses spilled out from their limits, especially in the direction of the plain, lending the outskirts a somewhat dishevelled look. It was as if the place had been overrun and then retaken so often that it was weary of offering serious resistance to any future intruders, not out of weakness, but out of indolence, or maybe even out of a sense of its own strength. It looked as if it had no need to flaunt itself. It reigned above the fragrant basin at its feet, and that seemed to suffice. This equally homely and self-confident place was the town of Grasse, for decades now the uncontested centre for production of and commerce in scents, perfumes, soaps and oils. Giuseppe Baldini had always uttered the name with enraptured delight. 
The town was the Rome of scents, the promised land of perfumers, and the man who had not earned his spurs here did not rightfully bear the title of perfumer. Grunwy gazed very coolly at the town of Grasse. He was not seeking the promised land of perfumers, and his heart did not leap at the sight of this small town clinging to the far slopes. He had come because he knew that he could learn about several techniques for production of scent there better than elsewhere and he wanted to acquire them, for he needed them for his own purposes. He pulled the flacon with his perfume from his pocket, dabbed himself lightly, and continued on his way. An hour and a half later, around noon, he was in Grasse. He ate at an inn near the top of the town, on the Place aux Airs. The square was divided lengthwise by a brook, where tanners washed their hides and afterwards spread them out to dry. The odour was so pungent that many a guest lost his appetite for his meal, but not Grunwy. It was a familiar odour to him. It gave him a sense of security. In every city he always sought out the tanning district first, and then, emerging from that region of stench to explore the other parts of the place, he no longer felt a stranger. He spent all that afternoon wandering about the town. It was unbelievably filthy, despite or perhaps directly because of all the water that gushed from springs and wells, gurgling down through the town in unchanneled rivulets and brooks, undermining the streets or flooding them with muck. In some neighbourhoods the houses stood so close together that only a yard-wide space was left for passageways and stairs, forcing pedestrians to jostle one another as they waded through the mire. And even in the square and along the few broader streets, vehicles could hardly get out of each other's way. Nevertheless, However filthy, cramped and slovenly, the town was bursting with the bustle of commerce. During his tour, Grenouille spotted no less than seven soapworks, a dozen master perfumers and lovers, countless small distilleries, pomade studios and spice shops, and finally some seven wholesalers in scents. These were in fact merchants who completely controlled the wholesale supply of scent. One would hardly know it by their houses. The facades to the street looked modestly middle-class, but what was stored behind them, in warehouses and in gigantic cellars, in kegs of oil, in stacks of finest lavender soap, in demijohns of floral colognes, wines, alcohols, in bales of scented leather, in sacks and chests and crates stuffed with spices, Grenouille smelled out every detail through the thickest walls. These were riches beyond those of princes. And when he smelled his way more penetratingly through the prosaic shops and storerooms fronting the streets, he discovered that at the rear of these provincial family homes were buildings of the most luxurious sort, around small but exquisite gardens where oleander and palm trees flourished and fountains bordered by ornamental flowers leaped, extended the actual residential wings, usually built in a U-shape towards the south. On the upper floors, bedchambers drenched in sunlight, the walls covered with silk. On the ground floor, wainscoted salons and dining rooms, sometimes with terraces built out into the open air, where, just as Baldini had said, people ate from porcelain with golden cutlery. The gentlemen who lived behind these modest sham facades reeked of gold and power, of carefully secured riches, and they reeked of it more strongly than anything Grenouille had smelled thus far on his journey through the provinces. He stopped and stood for a good while in front of one of these camouflaged palazzi. The house was at the beginning of the Rue Droite, a main artery that traversed the whole length of the city from east to west. It was nothing extraordinary to look at. Perhaps the front was a little wider and ampler than its neighbours, but certainly not imposing. At the gateway stood a wagon from which kegs were being unloaded down a ramp. A second vehicle stood waiting. A man with some papers went into the office, came back out with another man. Both of them disappeared through the gateway. Grenouille stood on the opposite side of the street and watched the comings and goings. He was not interested in what was happening, and yet he stood there. Something else was holding him fast. He closed his eyes and concentrated on the odours that came floating to him from the building across the way. There were the odours of the kegs, vinegar and wine, then the hundredfold heavy odours of the warehouse, then the odours of wealth that the walls exuded like a fine golden sweat, and finally 
the odours of a garden that had to lie on the far side of the building. It was not easy to catch the delicate scents of the garden, for they came only in thin ribbons from over the house's gables and down into the street. Grenouille discerned magnolia, hyacinth, daphne and rhododendron. But there seemed to be something else besides, something in the garden that gave off a fatally wonderful scent, a scent so exquisite that in all his life his nose had never before encountered one like it, or indeed only once before. He had to get closer to that scent. He considered whether he ought simply to force his way through the gate and onto the premises, but meanwhile so many people had become involved in unloading and inventorying the kegs that he was sure to be noticed. He decided to walk back down the street and find an alley or passageway that would perhaps lead him along the far side of the house. Within a few yards he had reached the city gate at the start of the Rue Duat. He walked through it, took a sharp left, and followed the town wall down the mountain. He had not gone far before he smelled the garden, faintly at first, blended with the air from the fields, but then ever more strongly. Finally he knew that he was very close. The garden bordered on the town wall. It was directly beside him. If he moved back a bit he could see the top branches of the orange trees just over the wall. Again he closed his eyes. The scents of the garden descended upon him their contours as precise and clear as the coloured bands of a rainbow. And that one, that precious one, the one that mattered above all else, was among them. Grenouille turned hot with rapture and cold with fear. Blood rushed to his head as if he were a little boy caught red-handed, and then it retreated to his solar plexus, and then rushed up again and retreated again, and he could do nothing to stop it. This attack of scent had come on too suddenly. For a moment, for a breath, for an eternity, it seemed to him, time was doubled or had disappeared completely, for he no longer knew whether now was now and here was here, or whether now was not in fact then and here there, that is, the Rue des Marais in Paris, September 1753. The scent floating out of the garden was the scent of the red-headed girl he had murdered that night, to have found that scent in this world again brought tears of bliss to his eyes, and to know that it could not possibly be true frightened him to death. He was dizzy. He tottered a little and had to support himself against the wall, sinking slowly down against it in a crouch. Collecting himself and gaining control of his senses, he began to inhale the fatal scent in short, less dangerous breaths and he established that, while the scent from behind the wall bore an extreme resemblance to the scent of the red-headed girl, it was not completely the same. To be sure, it also came from a red-headed girl, there was no doubt of that. In his olfactory imagination, Grenouille saw this girl as if in a picture. She was not sitting still. She was jumping about, warming up and then cooling off, apparently playing some game in which she had to move quickly and then just as quickly stand still with a second person, by the way, someone with a quite insignificant odour. She had dazzlingly white skin. She had green eyes. She had freckles on her face, neck and breasts. That is, and Grenouille's breath stopped for a moment. Then he sniffed more vigorously and tried to suppress the memory of the scent of the girl from the Rue des Marais. That is, this girl did not even have breasts in the true sense of the word. She barely had the rudimentary beginnings of breasts, infinitely tender and with hardly any fragrance, sprinkled with freckles, just beginning to expand, perhaps only in the last few days, perhaps in the last few hours, perhaps only just at this moment. Such were the little cupped breasts of this girl. In a word, the girl was still a child. But what a child! The sweat stood out on Grenouille's forehead. He knew that children did not have an exceptional scent any more than green buds of flowers before they blossom. This child behind the wall, however, this bud still almost closed tight, which only just now was sending out its first fragrant tips, unnoticed by anyone except by him, Grenouille, this child already had a scent so terrifyingly celestial that once it had unfolded its total glory, it would unleash a perfume such as the world had never smelled before. 
She already smells better now, Grenouille thought, than that girl did back then in the Rue des Marais. Not as robust, not as voluminous, but more refined, more richly nuanced, and at the same time more natural. In a year or two, this scent will be ripened and take on a gravity that no one, man or woman, will be able to escape. People will be overwhelmed, disarmed, helpless before the magic of this girl, and they will not know why. And because people are stupid and use their noses only for blowing, but believe absolutely anything they see with their eyes, they will say it is because this is a girl with beauty and grace and charm. In their obtuseness they will praise the evenness of her features, her slender figure, her faultless breasts. And her eyes, they will say, are like emeralds, and her teeth like pearls, and her limbs smooth as ivory, and all those other idiotic comparisons. And they will elect her queen of the jasmine, and she will be painted by stupid portraitists. Her picture will be ogled, and people will say that she is the most beautiful woman in France. And to the strains of mandolins, youths will howl the nights away sitting beneath her window. Rich, fat old men will skid about on their knees, begging her father for her hand, and women of every age will sigh at the sight of her, and in their sleep dream of looking as alluring as she for just one day. And none of them will know that it is truly not how she looks that has captured them, nor her reputed unblemished external beauty, but solely her incomparable, splendid scent. Only he would know that, only Grenouille. He alone. He knew it already, in fact. Ah, he wanted to have that scent. Not in the useless, clumsy fashion by which he had had the scent of the girl in the Rue des Marais, for he had merely sucked that into himself and destroyed it in the process. No, he wanted truly to possess the scent of this girl behind the wall, to peel it from her like skin and to make her scent his own. How that was to be done he did not know yet, but he had two years in which to learn. Ultimately it ought to be no more difficult than robbing a rare flower of its perfume. He stood up, almost reverently, as if leaving behind something sacred or someone in deep sleep. He moved on, softly, hunched over so that no one might see him, no one might hear him, no one might be made aware of his precious discovery. And so he fled along the wall to the opposite end of the town, where he finally lost the girl's scent and re-entered by way of the Porte des Fénéons. He stood in the shadow of the buildings. The stinking vapours of the streets made him feel secure and helped him to tame the passions that had overcome him. Within fifteen minutes he had grown perfectly calm again. To start with, he thought, he would not again approach the vicinity of the garden behind the wall. That was not necessary. It excited him too much. The flower would flourish there without his aid, and he knew already in what manner it would flourish. He dared not intoxicate himself with that scent prematurely. He had to throw himself into his work. He had to broaden his knowledge and perfect the techniques of his craft in order to be equipped for the time of harvest. He had a good two years. <laughs>